Welcome to the 2016 Whittington Lecture. I'm pleased to see so many of our McCourt faculty and students here, as well as students from across the Georgetown campus. I'm especially pleased to be able to introduce our lecturer this year, Secretary Tom Perez. The Secretary of the Department of Labor, Secretary Ch Perez is a champion of the kinds of public policies and issues that were designed to make our economy work for everyone in America. Leslie Whittington shared this commitment to improving opportunity for everyone. As a professor of economics and public finance, her passion lay squarely in family economic policy, issues like the impact of the marriage tax and the status of women in the workforce. As many of you know, Leslie was an esteemed and accomplished member of our faculty. She was the associate dean, admired by legions of her students, many of whom have kept, touch, kept in touch with her through the years, even after they graduated. While we are fortunate to have many of outstanding faculty, her high-spirited and engaging lectures really ensured that her classes were some of the most hard to get into and greatest demand. Tragically, Leslie and her husband, Charlie, and two daughters were taken from us 15 years ago on 9-11. But I have no doubt that if she were here, she'd be sitting in the front row, ready to ask Secretary Prez the very first question. Back in the 1950s, Ted Sorensen, the speechwriter for then Secret Senator John F. Kennedy, came across a slogan up in New England that said, a rising tide lifts all boats. And he decided that was a perfect metaphor for economic prosperity. Since then, we've heard the phrase hundreds of times and that kind of shared prosperity, but that kind of shared prosperity doesn't just happen. It's a result of choices that each of us make individually and collectively. In this room today, future public servants and policy experts, future business leaders, uh, and all of us who are already in the workplace have a choice of what kind of country we want to live in. We elect leaders who, through treaties and legislation and regulation, set the economic rules of the road, and every day we make choices of the kinds of businesses where we spend our money and we want to support and the kinds of principles that they stand for. Over the past century, we have seen how well-functioning market economies have incredible power to generate uh, innovation and bring products to the market that our grandparents never even imagined. They have lifted millions of people out of poverty uh, and ushered in a new middle class across the globe. Last year, we got welcome, last week, we got welcome news that the Census Bureau uh, told us that median income for households, the typical household in America, actually went up, the biggest raise in over 10 years, uh, and the big first increase since the Great Recession. Not only that, the number of people living in poverty fell, declined by three and a half million. Welcome signs for sure, but more needs, more needs to be done because if we look at the distribution of income and wealth, over the last 10, 20 years, it's become more and more skewed. The top one-tenth of 1% 1 of Americans have as much wealth as the bottom 90%. Across the globe, the richest 16 families, 62, I'm sorry, the richest 62 families control as much wealth as half of the global population. Inequality between men and women, blacks and whites, Hispanics still exists. But going forward, we need efforts to try and lift all boats to, to try and address these inequalities. We need to develop strategies around inclusive prosperity. This has been the theme of the Courts ba Baker Center and others on campus. It's a theme that deeply resonates with Georgetown's mission to promote social action and encourage a life of service to others. As Mahatma Gandhi said, we need not wait to see what others will do. Secretary Perez is on exactly that mission. He does not wait to see what others will do. Over the past three years, he has made shared prosperity a central mission of his tenure as labor secretary. He has collaborated with private sector employers, with labor unions and nonprofits and foundations to create partnerships to advance that goal. We look forward to hearing much more about these efforts this morning. Secretary Perez has served at the Justice Department before becoming Secretary of Labor in this administration, and he served at the Health and Human Services Department under the Clinton administration He's also worked in the state government, where he was labor secretary under, uh, in, in the state of Maryland, uh, and he was a counselor for the late Senator Edward Kennedy. I've known Tom for many years and worked with him when he was the secretary of labor at Maryland. He's a determined fighter uh, who will uh, persevere against all odds, and there probably is no greater symbol of his doggedness in the face of opposition than the fact that he still is a Buffalo Bills fan after all these years. <laughs> secretary Perez, welcome to George.
Good morning. Thank you uh, uh, for those kind remarks. And uh, as a Buffalo Bills fan, we always say that false hope is better than no hope at all. <laughs> and I'm living by that. And uh, in Buffalo, uh, Ed, I, I had the privilege of going to a Jesuit high school. So it's great to be back here in a wonderful Jesuit institution. I went to the same high school as uh, the late, great Tim Russert. Meet the Press was in blue and gold, the colors of Canisius High School. So our and my wife's uncle is a Jesuit, so uh, the Jesuit ethos is a big part of who I am. And, and you all know Ed, but uh, Ed's got game. And, and what I think I like the most about Ed is not his keen intellect and sound judgment, but um, there's this um, adage in life, you know, it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. And that's what I like about Ed. In a town where there are a lot of sharp elbows, uh, Ed is not one of them. And so, Ed, thank you for... Uh, the work that you've done, and it's it's very meaningful to be here uh, delivering the Winnington Lecture because she has some Maryland roots, uh, as I was uh, learning as I learned about her, and um, I was certainly inspired by her work and, and profoundly saddened by her loss, and I did a little um, uh, dive to see uh, if any of our colleagues at DOL had worked with her, and, I, and one of my favorite people, Amanda Allstrand, who works in our um, Employment and Training Administration, uh, did uh, actually study under her, and um, she remembered uh, her as the embodiment of the idea of a professor and coach. She was not just there to teach us the academics, but to make them real. And uh, that resonated with me, because behind every data point, and we'll have a few data points this morning, um, is people. It's people who are struggling to make ends meet, people who want to realize the American dream of prosperity. And that's why, as Labor Secretary, I really believe it's important uh, to make uh, house calls, to take the conversation on the road. And, and, I, and in that capacity, meaning no disrespect to Lou Gehrig, I do feel like the luckiest person on the face of the earth because I've gotten to meet people who are doing extraordinary things, have overcome extraordinary odds. And, and when I read about folks who are chronically pessimistic, I don't understand it when I hear leaders talk um, you know, they talk bad things about America because uh, the America that I see are people who do extraordinary work day in and day out to shape a brighter future for our nation. I was at the National Harbor this morning with a group of about 500 grassroots advocates, 99.9% uh, .9 of whom are women of color, uh, out there uh, across America advocating for justice and fairness in a variety of areas, whether it's for home health workers, domestic workers, um, women who are victims of domestic violence, uh, so many different contexts. And uh, one of the leaders of, the, of, of this movement that I spoke at this morning, a woman named Mai Jin Poo, who is a MacArthur Genius Award winner. Uh, and uh, she is not only a MacArthur Award winner, but she puts her uh, keen intellect to work every single day to build an America that works for everyone. Yesterday, I was in uh, Connecticut. Uh, visiting a, a jail, because um, as a former prosecutor, I'm proud of the work I did as a prosecutor, and I really think you got to be smart on crime. And uh, smart on crime, if you're simply the, have only one tool in your toolbox and it's a hammer, pretty soon everything starts looking like a nail. And uh, we've made some remarkable investments, and uh, the program I visited in um, New Haven is called Linking to Employment Activities Pre-Release, or LEAP. And uh, we've done a lot of LEAP grants. These are grants that are designed to help people get skills while they are still in jail so that they can come out of jail and be ready to work. Because rather than just locking them up and throwing away the key, why don't we unlock their potential while they are in prison? We did this when I was in local government. And uh, we've been doing it for 10 years in Montgomery County. And it's worked. And it's helped make communities safer. It's helped make institutions safer. And it has helped people to get the jobs and the skills that they need. And it's helped employers who want to um, grow their business. And uh, the, most, the, the, the uh, largest private employer in Maryland is Johns Hopkins. And the most prolific uh, employer of former offenders is also Johns Hopkins Medical Center. And they do that not as an act of charity, but as an act of enlightened self-interest. And I met a guy yesterday, and um, I was walking out, and I got handed this note. And this is why I like my job. I never met this guy before in my life, but I talked to him when he was in jail yesterday. And his, I, I won't tell you his name for privacy sakes, but um, I wish to tell you about what the Job Alliance means to me. This is the best by far program I've ever been involved in. 
They're giving me a chance at a new beginning, teaching me that it is never too late to learn. They're helping me with job placement, housing, and most importantly, my self-esteem to know that I can still be a productive member of society. I thought I was done. I didn't think I would be able to turn myself around, and I didn't think anybody cared. I'm excited about the future. I plan to take full advantage of this program. So in closing, thank you for this opportunity. It has changed my life for the better. That's what I got yesterday. And that's why I make house calls, because you know what? Um, I believe in second chances. And frankly, I have an ambivalent relationship with the word second chance, because it implies that folks had a first chance to begin with. And so uh, that's the reason I love my work day in and day out. And I have 122 days till the weekend. And um, what I'm trying to do is not simply count the days, but make the days count and make sure that we indeed uh, build an economy and a society that works for everyone. And in so doing, I think the most important point that I can make to you is that what we do here is about choices. We have a choice now about how we lead our nation. And you all, as students, are at the tip of the spear. We have a choice between building shared prosperity or simply accepting a system in which some people believe, I'm not one of them, that if you blow out your neighbor's candle, it'll make your candle shine brighter. We have a choice between slashing budgets or investing people in people and their potential. My biggest frustration about that program I just described is that I know it works, but I can't get more funding for it because we live in the world of uh, mindless austerity. Uh, we have a choice between racing to the bottom or rising to the top. We have a choice between building higher walls or bigger tables. And indeed, I think the leaders in this room have a tremendous role to play in growing our economy and generating that shared prosperity because I really believe, and I spend a lot of time now in graduate schools, business schools, public policy schools, and the like. And, and that's because I really think that you uh, are the key to making sure that this rising tide lifts all the boats and not simply the yachts because we have a real chance to get ahead, but we have to summon some first principles. And uh, that's really what I want to talk to you about, is what are those first principles today? And I want to talk to you about some of the folks um, that have helped us build this shared prosperity, that are committed to making everybody's candle shine brighter and not blowing out candles. Some of those people that I've met are public servants, leaders at all levels of government who spend every day asking the same question, how can I improve the lot of ordinary people? How are the decisions I am making today going to affect the next generation. And they recognize, and I've learned this from a quarter century of public service, that success in any important initiative is an inside-outside partnership. You need people inside government with vision and drive. And you need people outside government holding people inside government accountable. You look at the Voting Rights Act. You look at the ADA. You look at the Fair Labor Standards Act. Those pieces of legislation, which are really crown jewels, in our infrastructure of democracy and economic opportunity, they were all passed as a result of inside-outside partnerships. Couldn't have done it without LBJ, but couldn't have done it without MLK. And those are examples. So many of the, the change agents I meet are business leaders who adhere to a model that uh, they call, and I call, conscious capitalism. Some refer to it as inclusive capitalism. They know that their shareholders are best served when all stakeholders are well served. And they mean all stakeholders. They mean their workers, their customers, their supply chains, the environment. Some are advocates who work every day uh, at a grassroots level, like Aijin that I just mentioned, uh, making sure that people have a voice. Because I used to go to the Humphrey Building every day when I was at HHS in the Clinton administration. And next to his bust was a simple statement of uh, really the role of folks in government. The moral test of um, our nation is how we treat those in the dawn of life, our children, how we treat those in the twilight of life, the elderly, and how we treat those in the shadows of life. And so many public servants, business leaders, and advocates understand that that is indeed um, the moral test of our nation and, and the unfinished business of our nation. And as we talk about building shared prosperity, I do think it's important to level set because there are a few people in America right now who have a case of selective amnesia. And I do think it's important to talk about where we were, where we've come, and then how we indeed build an economy of shared prosperity. 
And, you know, in the three months before the president took office, as you know, the economy was hemorrhaging jobs. 2.3 million jobs lost in the three months before the president took office. Uh, as Dean Montgomery can tell you better than perhaps anyone, the auto industry was flat on its back. It was on life support. Um, frankly, uh, many in Congress had pulled the plug. The unemployment rate was heading toward 10%. We had seven job seekers for every job opening. Now you look at where we are now, 71 months in a row of job growth. Our unemployment rate is now 4.9%. Uh, we have 1.3 job seekers uh, for every job opening instead of seven job seekers. And again, I went to law school, public policy school, because I was lousy at math. But you, know, you don't need to be a math whiz to figure out that you'd rather compete against one person for a job uh, than seven people for a job. You know, we now have an unemployment rate that's 4.9%. Uh, and as, as uh, Dean Montgomery said, uh, you look at uh, what we saw in the census report. Uh, last year alone, American families saw their income go up by more than 5%, which is the largest increase on record. And it actually proportionally went up the highest for those at the lowest end of the income strata. That is good news. Uh, some people said, oh, what about rural America? Well, the Census Bureau came out a couple of days later to correct its data to say, yes, we've seen similar growth in rural America as well. We have 5.9 million job openings right now. That is a bellwether of a healthy economy. Uh, and so uh, we saw poverty in America uh, have the largest one-year decline since 1968. So uh, it is undeniable that we're better off now than we were eight years ago. We've made tremendous progress. We're out of the ditch, we're on the road, and we're moving forward. But um, we're not where we need to be. There's no one in the White House spiking the football uh, because we know there's a lot of unfinished business. And that's because I make house calls. And for every person who has been able to climb out uh, from the depths of the recession, I meet too many people who are still struggling. Although average earnings are improving, the long-term trend is still stagnant wages that aren't doing enough to keep up with productivity. And we have huge opportunity gaps. No matter how hard they work, too many people indeed are struggling uh, to get by. And, and the economy for all too many is out of balance. Um, I look at the 2014 data, uh, and this one always makes me shake my head. The, the Wall Street bonus pool in 2014, that's the combined bonuses of Wall Street executives, just their bonuses, by the way, was $28.5 billion, roughly double uh, the total earnings of all full-time federal uh, minimum wage workers, over a million workers, making less than half of the Wall Street bonus pool. So it's not hard to figure out why folks have angst. And, and it doesn't have to be that way. Remember my number one point. These are choices. You'll hear some people say, well, these are structural problems, technology, globalization. You know, the, uh, the, the cost of doing business in the 21st century is low wages and no benefits. I say nonsense to that. I don't buy it. I think structural problems all too frequently are simply excuse making, a way to justify inertia, gridlock, the status quo, and to avoid bold decisions and strong leadership. And here's what I found in over three years as Labor Secretary. There is absolutely no shortage of smart, forward-looking people in our country who make bold decisions and move us forward through the public and the private sectors at the federal level and then when the federal level is broken at state and local levels. Leadership in the public sector, I see day in and day out. I meet colleagues who inspire me. People like Dr. Anthony Fauci, the infectious disease chief at NIH, uh, I remember uh, having dinner with him recently, and he gave me just a remarkably inspiring uh, history lesson on how we tackled Ebola. You remember that crisis in 2014. Dr. Fauci was at the tip of the spear, and he managed billions of dollars and still took two hours out of every day to treat Ebola patients. Leadership at the public sector is everywhere, and you are going to be some of those leaders of tomorrow. And those leaders helped us pass and implement the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you know, I, one of my favorite people in government is uh, Vice President Joe Biden, and he correctly referred to uh, the Affordable Care Act as a BFD. I'll just refer to the B and the D part of that because we're at Georgetown, but a big deal. Um, but when something's a really big deal, we get to that level. And I meet people day in and day out who are benefiting from the Affordable Care Act. And the, the guy that I remember the most is a guy named Ward, who was a long haul truck driver down in Tennessee. Um, on March the 1st of 2015, 
uh, ward coverage finally went into effect. On March the 15th, he had a liver transplant. The Affordable Care Act literally saved his life. And uh, when I met Ward, uh, he was on the mend. He was still unemployed. And I said, Ward, you know, now that you got your life back, what do you want to do? And, and I asked the same question of other people who got their life back by the Affordable Care Act. And I got the same answer from everyone. I want to get a job again. I want to be a taxpayer again. And I can't help but wonder, why is it that so many people are hell-bent on making it hard for people to get access to health care so they can become a taxpayer again? And you look at the data on the Affordable Care Act, and you see that we could make, we, we've made so much progress already, and we could make so much more progress with one simple intervention. That is the expansion of Medicaid in states where it has not happened. That is the reality. And I see these forward-leaning leaders, Republican and Democrat across the country, who've said, we're going to do this. Because, by the way, it's not only the right thing to do on the health care front and on the human front, but it's the smart thing to do on the economic front. States are leaving billions of dollars on the table. And so I see that leadership in action. I see leadership in the small business context, in the large business context, and in between. You know, from the bookstore I visited in Fairbanks, Alaska, to the Ace Hardware store that's a mile from my house, I meet with CEOs all the time who reject the false argument that high wages kill jobs or stifle business growth. Instead, they're embracing the notion that better paid workers are more productive workers who provide top-notch, superior customer service, and that leads to higher retention rates and lower training and turnover rates, and that's good for business. I was with a Fortune 100 senior executive last week who said, you know, the cost of training someone, the cost of replacing someone for us is in the tens of thousands of dollars. So we don't want to lose people. It costs money. Leadership in the private sector are people like Andrea Rush, a woman I met in Detroit. She owns the largest manufacturing company in 20 years to locate to the city of Detroit. And she's created over a thousand jobs and we helped her do it. We were her HR department. And she hired people who were, uh, had a criminal record. She hired people uh, who were veterans. She hired people who used to live in the community in the city of Detroit who thought they'd never work again in the city of Detroit. She's making things because she had a remarkable vision. Leadership are folks like uh, Costco. You know, I've got a Costco card that's so old in my pocket that I had hair. My, my daughter's 20 years old. We got it when she was born because we used to buy diapers at scale. And uh, you know what? They were a high-road employer before being a high-road employer was cool. And they've demonstrated that you can work in low-margin businesses, and they don't have to be bottom-feeding businesses. And if you had bought $1,000 worth of Costco stock in the 80s and held on to it, you would have roughly doubled the returns of the S&P 500 over that same period. These are not isolated examples. I meet people all the time. One of my favorite people is a guy named Kip Tyndall. We've done work together on conscious capitalism. He's the CEO of a publicly traded company, the Container Store, and he's one of the leaders of the movement. And when you look at the Fortune 500 uh, companies and you look at the, the data on the best places to work in America, the publicly traded companies in the best places to work outperform their rivals by about a two-to-one margin. So this isn't about, you know, uh, social engineering. This isn't about uh, being nice. This is about enlightened self-interest. This is about building um, an America that works for everyone, understanding that the high road is indeed the smart road. And these businesses and others that I meet are challenging all the truisms that paying high wages undermines competitiveness, that unionization stunts economic growth, that vigilance about worker safety or environmental stewardship is bad for business. They're challenging and debunking all of these myths. And for me, the challenge moving forward is to make sure that these leaders inside and outside of government are the rule and not the exception. Because I get asked a very fair question. If you're so correct, then why isn't everybody doing this, Tom? And that's a fair question. And that's why we're building a movement. And, and as we consider how to do that, how to scale these remarkable um, models and movements, I think it's important to go back to some of our history. And uh, 
And I can't help in reflecting on our history but uh, to think about a guy named uh, Leon Sullivan. Uh, he was, uh, uh, Reverend Sullivan was a Philadelphia-based Baptist minister who was one of, I think, the first African-American to serve on the board of a Fortune uh, 500 company. He served on the board of GM. And he used that role as a platform for anti-apartheid activism. And he developed what was known as uh, the Sullivan Principles, which are a simple code of conduct for companies and the nations where they do business. And it included equal pay, non-segregation, training opportunities, quality of life and housing, education, and health. And these principles became a catalyst for divestment. They were later adopted by the United Nations. And, as, and it seems to me, as we move forward thinking about how we build shared prosperity, it strikes me that we ought to consider, and we're in a good academic setting to do so, a Sullivan principles uh, for shared prosperity in the American workforce. And, and I think these are principles of proven and effective long-term uh, governance. And not only that, I think there's some of our core principles and values that have motivated and animated our country. And so I've come up with a few. I suspect that you may agree with some and disagree with others. And I'm certain that I've left out others. And so um, I wanted to give you some food for thought. And I hope you'll agree with some, and I'm confident you'll disagree with others. And I, principle number one for me is I think we should reject false choices and think long term. Rejecting the false choice that suggests that you either take care of your business or your consumers or your workers. Effective leaders can do all three. They reject these zero-sum games. In the civil rights space in which I was involved in for uh, many years, I saw false choices at work every day. We either keep our communities safe or we respect the Constitution. You're either on the side of the police or you're on the side of the community. Those are false choices. And those are unnecessary choices. I saw it in so many other contexts. And so when we respect false choices and know that shareholders are best served when all stakeholders are well served, we can build an economy of shared prosperity. Principle number two, embodied in what FDR called the second most important piece of legislation to safeguard workers after the Social Security Act. If you work a full-time job in America, you shouldn't have to live in poverty, and you shouldn't have to rely on food stamps to feed your family. That is the fundamental premise of the Fair Labor Standards Act, and that is a crown jewel of American worker protection. Principle number three, rights at work are essential to thriving democracies. All workers deserve a meaningful say in the decisions that affect them. And I've learned at the Department of Labor because I'm not afraid to acknowledge that I've seldom had an original idea in my life, that when you listen to your workers and when you give them a seat at the table, we get more done. That's the world we live in. You know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. I learned that all too often. And there are many different ways to provide workers with that voice. I happen to believe that the union movement is one of the most important forces that brought this nation the middle class. And that collective bargaining has been one of the most important forces. And you look at the data. When we saw middle class prosperity rising in the post-World War II era, we also saw union density rising. And when you look at some of the studies, a number of them estimate that about a third of the challenges confronting the middle class today are the result of the decline in union density. Workers have less of a voice, and workers can't advocate as a result. And so unionization is one way to ensure worker voice. There are others that have been effective. Pick one, but make sure you pick one so that workers can indeed have a seat at the table. Principle number four, if we really believe that family comes first and we really believe in family values, let's not pay lip service to it. Let's put it in action. We're the only advanced economy in the world where paid leave is a partisan debate, where we don't have some form of federal paid leave. When I talk to parents about the kitchen table issues that keep them up most at night, child care and paid leave are at the top of the list. So many families whose rent or mortgage um, is actually less than their child care bill. So many parents who aren't going back to work because the economics don't work. And when I hear people criticize our labor force participation rates, these are the same people all too frequently who oppose efforts at sensible child care and paid leave policies. 
we got to, we're in the modern family universe. We got to move away from leave it a beaver and Aussie and Harriet. Principle number five, innovation is America's middle name. It's what we've always been about. At the same time, I believe the key to long-term success is inclusive innovation. And so we talk a lot about the on-demand economy. We talk a lot about technological advance, and we've got to make sure that we embrace these things, but that we embrace them in a way that brings about inclusive innovation. Because it's great to have that freedom to work when you want or when you don't want, but what happens when you get in a car accident and you have no health insurance, you have no workers' comp, you have no safety net? We've got to build that social compact 2.0 for the 21st century, and we've got to make sure that while we embrace innovation, we ensure that it's inclusive. And it can never be innovation that compromises labor standards or leaves people behind. Principle number six, successful businesses and nations and communities embrace diversity. And that has been a linchpin of our success. As someone I spoke to recently, a, a Fortune 500 CEO, who was very involved in efforts to preserve affirmative action. As they said to me, you know what? I do it because it's smart, not because it's PC. And as I said to them, you know what? I teach my kids, you know, we tolerate Brussels sprouts. We embrace diversity. Uh, tolerance is one of my least favorite words, frankly, in the English language. We should be doing more than tolerate diversity. We should be recognizing that our diversity is one of our greatest sources of our strength as a nation. E pluribus unum means something, and it has brought our nation so much prosperity. We should be embracing our diversity, not using it as a force of division. Because we know that today's immigrant or refugee is tomorrow's business owner, tomorrow's dean, tomorrow's mayor or governor or CEO. And that is why we must embrace our diversity, and it must always be a first principle of shared prosperity. Principle number seven, we must always make sure we fortify not only the infrastructure of economic opportunity, but the infrastructure of democracy. We need to make sure we preserve the right to vote. We need to make sure that we work collaboratively on issues of lawful constitutional policing. We need to make sure that while we have robust spirited debates, everybody who's eligible to vote ought to be able to vote. And as someone who spent a lot of time on these voter ID laws, let me be frank about what I observed. These were efforts to make it harder for African Americans and Latinos to vote. If you don't agree with what someone's believing, that's your prerogative, but don't make it harder for eligible people to vote. That is inconsistent with our democratic principles. And here is my final thought, my final principle, which is I think something that has embodied our nation forever, which is that we all succeed only when we all succeed. One of my favorite readings, and I've read it about 75 times conservatively, is Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail. And every time I read it, there's another sentence or two that captures my imagination. And recently, as I've watched the events unfold in Flint, as I've watched um, the policing issues and all the other issues that have kept us up at night, I can't help but reflect on what Dr. King said. We are caught up in an inescapable, inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be, until I am what I ought to be. That's what Dr. King said. Injustice anywhere is indeed a threat to justice everywhere. And I really believe that we work best when we feel the full team. And we work best when we recognize that every single person does have gifts and talents. The person I met yesterday in Connecticut and the CEO I met the day before, they all have gifts and talents. But I think we're at our strongest when we feel that full team, when we grow together when we innovate together. You know, we pride ourselves on this rugged individualism in our country, but I really do believe that the truth of the matter is that we are indeed strongest when we work together, when we sacrifice together. That's what we did during the Great Recession, and that is how we grow together. And we grow together by recognizing, I think, uh, what I call the gyroscope. Um, Walter Isaacson, um, a, a noted author, is one of my favorite people, and I've gotten to know him a little bit. And he's written a lot of biographies, as you know. 
And uh, he wrote a biography of a guy named uh, Albert Einstein, pretty smart guy, I'm told. And uh, Albert Einstein came to America to flee Nazi Germany. And he wrote a series of letters that Walter describes in his biography to his son. And the first, one of the first letters he describes is in the early 50s, in the height of the McCarthy era. And he writes to his son and he says, I don't know what is wrong with this country. What is going on? Um, I fled Nazi Germany because of the unconscionable activity of Hitler. And, and I see in McCarthy some of the same forces that led me to lead Germany. And then you fast forward like a year or so later, uh, McCarthy's been censured, uh, reduced to the dustbin of history. He writes another letter to his son in which he says, this is an awesome country. What a remarkable place. It has a gyroscope. And one, just when you think that gyroscope is going to spin out of control, it writes itself. Well, I leave you with this thought. The gyroscope that he describes is not a piece of technology. The gyroscope is what the president described last year when he went to Selma to mark the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. That gyroscope is the most important word in a democracy, the simple two-letter word, we. Because it was that gyroscope of we the people that led to the decline and to the censure of Joe McCarthy. That gyroscope led to the know-nothing era becoming, again, a footnote in American history. That gyroscope is what brought us Shared prosperity, that gyroscope is what led women in the early 20th century to say, we should have the right to vote too. That gyroscope brought us the civil rights movement. That gyroscope has brought us so many good things that lead us moving forward. And that gyroscope is about choices. So to you who are students in this room, you have choices. And when you, look out, when you look out there, and you may be frustrated some days, you may be wondering what the hell is going on some days, but you know what? The answer is still the same. We the people, you can be involved in these choices. And you're going to public policy school, and I went to public policy school because, frankly, I wanted to change the world. And you have that opportunity. And we're in one of these where were you moments in American history, those where were you moments where in 40 years when your children or grandchildren ask you, you know, where were you in 2016 when we were kind of at a fork in the road? We weren't simply talking about our economy. We were talking about our values. Where were you? This ain't a spectator sport. Life is a participatory sport. Democracy is a participatory sport. And with the skills and competencies you gain here from the remarkable cadre of professors, including Professor Whittington, including Professor and Dean Montgomery. You are well prepared. And my major ask for you is, I'm getting old. I got replacement parts. And we need you to get and stay in the ball game because there's a lot at stake. And you are indeed the folks who are going to be the gyroscope of tomorrow. So make sure you continue to be that gyroscope and put your values in action day in and day out. I may not be the richest guy in, in the world financially, but I can tell you that over the course of a quarter century, uh, the, the non-monetary rewards of the things I've had the privilege of getting involved in have been and continue to be priceless. So thank you so much, Ed, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you for the, the speech, Secretary Perez. I have Tom's a lot quicker, by the way. So just, <laughs> we're in a public policy school. Come on. That was the difference between Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School. Law School, everyone was Professor so-and-so. In the Kennedy School, everyone was Dutch and Joe and Jim. <laughs> well, so you've, you've been Labor Secretary for almost four years. You, you mentioned that you have uh, 100 days left uh, to 122. go. 122. Don't, 122. don't short me, Ed. <laughs> I won't, won't short you. What's your biggest accomplishment looking back, and what's the unfinished agenda looking forward from your perspective? Well, the thing I love the most about being the Labor Secretary is we help people at scale. You know, when you can go home and say, 
to your kid, well, we helped 2.1 million home health workers, mostly women of color on food stamps, get minimum wage and overtime protections. That, for me, is the definition of a good week. Right. You know, <laughs> when, when you help uh, tens of millions of people, uh, that, was my, that was my sister, so I want to thank her for <laughs> clapping. No. Um, when you can help uh, you know, tens of millions of people who have a 401k or an IRA and don't realize that their advisor doesn't have an, uh, an obligation to look out for their best interest, um, that is a multi-trillion dollar business and we were able to help that. So what I've liked the most about uh, DOL is um, our ability to help people at scale because that's what it's all about. I define our success right. as in, in that way. And, and I also love the fact, I love our workforce and you know it because you were there. Um, the, the career people in any agency, state, local, federal, are the spine of the agency. And um, we were, we, we've, I think, made a lot of progress in terms of addressing some internal issues. And, and when you don't get budgets, you know, we have a size 12 need and a size 9 budget. <laughs> and, and that's not going to change because Congress is broken. Uh, then you got to figure out other ways to get more productive. And one of the best ways to get more productive is to make sure that everybody has a hop in their step every day. So we work very hard at that. And so a big part of the unfinished business is to make sure that we um, sustain and institutionalize. You know, we, we now have a, an office of employee engagement. Uh, and we have a diversity and inclusion um, committee that's a permanent committee so that we can really engage our workforce. Um, those sorts of internal things don't make A1 of the Washington Post, but those are how you sustain um, organizations and make sure that people have a hop in their step. Because, you know, I can't give folks raises, you know. We're, nobody goes to work at the Labor Department to get rich. Or if they do, I've got to send them to the IG. Um, <laughs> and so we, I want to make sure they, they go to the work, they go to the Labor Department because they love it. And, and, and I love it too. So you, you have had a long history of working closely with uh, the labor movement, and you, you mentioned mm -hmm. their importance. But if we look at the data, they're about 6 to 8% of all workers in the country. The trend has been a, a one of decline. How do, can one increase their role in their growth uh, or yeah. uh, them, put them back at the play? In this yeah, case? no, I mean, the, the trend data is undeniably of, of concern. Uh, you know, the, the union density in the private sector is south of 10%. Uh, it's north of 10% in, in the public sector, but uh, there are a lot of headwinds. It's, it's sport in um, a lot of states for governors to take a whack at labor unions, Wisconsin being one example, but not the only example. Um, and uh, I went to the oral argument in the Friedrichs case last January. I came out, called a few of my friends in the union movement, and said, we're going to lose. And the only reason we didn't was Judge Justice Scalia passed away. Um, and so uh, we've had a lot of conversations. You, you, we've got to do things differently. We've got to make um, um, we, we've got to make the value proposition. And, and what I really appreciate about the union movement, you, you look at the Fight for 15 movement. Uh, Mary Kay Henry of SEIU has been one of the leaders there. And uh, she has not grown her uh, ranks of SEIU uh, by any at this point. Uh, what she, but what I, what I admire about the way she thinks about it and the way people like Lee Saunders have asked me think about it is they don't define success as how big is my membership. They're defining success as by how many people we help. And, and uh, the, the Fight for 15 movement was dismissed four years ago. That, that's never going to happen. We now have 20% of the American population living in states or localities that are covered by, the fight, by, by a $15 minimum wage. And, and so I think what forward-leaning leaders like Mary Kay and, and, and Lee and others have recognized is that uh, we have to change. And, and they are evolving. And you look at the membership of, of AFSME, for instance. They've actually increased their membership by something like 40 or 50,000 in the last year right. because they're recognizing, they're talking more to folks and, and figuring out exactly what we can do. And uh, I truly believe we're stronger together. And I truly believe when you look at the data of the labor movement and uh, you know the, in the post-war period, as the middle class grew, so did union density. And, and so I, I think workers need a voice. And, and, and that's why I've, and I grew up in Buffalo, New York. I saw how the union movement uh, helped in times of prosperity and in times of despair. And, and that is why I'm such a strong believer. And, I, and we've had a lot of, 
frank conversations about what we need to do differently. So you'd mentioned uh, uh, your work with uh, prisoners and going to jails. They're often the, the hardest uh, population to get reemployed. Uh, we've got some experts yeah. like Harry Holzer who've done a lot of work on trying to get employers. Mm -hmm. Many small businesses are very yeah. loath to, to take yeah. them on. What, what can we do for that population to make sure they share in our prosperity? Well, I'm really excited about uh, this opportunity. And I, I truly believe one of the basic principles of workforce development is, um, well, first of all, you have to be demand driven. You know, you don't train and pray. You know, you don't train widget makers and pray people are going to hire them. You know, you got to know what the demand needs are. The second principle is um, partnership, um, you know, among a, a whole array of stakeholders. And the third principle is you take the job seeker where you find them. And um, you know, many of the folks uh, that are behind bars have tremendous talent. Uh, I was with the warden, uh, Warden Feliciano, in um, New Haven yesterday, and I said, you know, you've been how long have you been in the business? And he's 35 years. And what have you learned most? And his answer was this: um, some of the smartest people I've ever met are the people who are behind bars. And uh, forward-leaning employers get that. Employers that I meet, like Hopkins Hospital, if, if uh, um, the CEO of Hopkins Hospital were here, he would tell you that they are the most prolific employer of uh, former offenders, not as an act of charity, but as an act of enlightened self-interest. They have studied this. Their, their workforce that has a criminal history, and by the way, they're not simply in lower level jobs. They're x-ray techs, they're phlebotomists, they're other allied health professions. Uh, they're all up and down the food chain. And they have um, lower attrition rates, uh, lower absenteeism rates. And that's because when you give them a chance, they remember it. <laughs> and they're loyal. And, uh, and I meet folks in the trades who say, like, I need a welder. And I don't care what you did in the past, but can you weld? And are you going to show up on time? You know, 8 o'clock isn't 8-ish. You know, are you going to show up? And so um, we've been able to marshal the fact that in many corners of the country, we have a workforce shortage. We have a lot of employers who are stepping up and then are willing to tell others. Because the best ambassador for the hiring of former offenders are other employers. You know, I, can, I can do my advocacy, um, but it takes other employers. And we have a lot of tools in the toolbox to help. So you, you, you say, well, you know, that guy's got a theft conviction. Is he going to steal from me? Well, guess what? We can deal with that. We have surety bonds. We'll insure that risk. You hire that person. If that person steals from you, you're held harmless. And we have uh, what we call, um, uh, you know, we, we have uh, wage subsidies. So we talked about this yesterday in Connecticut. We'll subsidize the wage for like a five or six month period. And then at the end, it's up to the employer to keep them. Our, our history with that program, over 90% of the folks stay on because the employers realize this guy's got game. So um, we're, we're trying to open the eyes of the employer community with the help of many forward-leaning employers to the fact that this is a great talent pool. So you grew up in Buffalo. I grew up in Pittsburgh. These are big manufacturing towns historically uh, where it's declined uh, over the last 20 years. And uh, a lot of workers uh, think that trade had a lot to do with it. Uh, and, and so we see in this election lots of conversations, uh, opposition to everything to NAFTA, to TPP, and others. What's your view about the role yeah. of trade legislation? And if, uh, clearly it has benefits, but how do we make sure it's broadly shared uh, if we continue to sure. do this? Well, I mean, yeah. trade is one of the hardest things to talk about. And in this cycle, it's in, you know, incredibly hard to talk about. And, and I grew up in Buffalo. I certainly saw firsthand um, impacts. And, and you know, the reality is that trade, in my opinion, oftentimes was promises made that weren't promises kept. Um, to me, the question that flows from that is not whether we just simply put up our hands, but can we learn from it? You know, can yeah. we, we, I don't think you can put the globalization genie back in the bottle. Um, and I don't think uh, you can say, uh, let's be a technology free zone. You know, a lot of the challenges we see in uh, manufacturing, as you know firsthand, is, is not globalization, but Technology. I mean, the, the plants I go to, uh, you know, people are walking around with iPads, and you just you require less people. The Republic Steel site, which has been mothballed in Buffalo for 30 years, is now being replaced by the largest solar panel manufacturing facility in the Western Hemisphere. That's an exciting development for Buffalo. 
um, they'll probably have about uh, a fifth of the workers that Republic Steel had in their heyday, and they require different skills. And so to me, and, and for the president, the challenge is, can we put American values on globalization? Uh, can we go to school on the lessons of and mistakes of history? And can we build trade agreements that, first and foremost, put American workers and American businesses first by creating a level playing field? And, and the reality right now is the status quo, you know, doing nothing has a real cost. Right. And, and when you go to places like Washington State, Washington State is the most trade-dependent state in the country. Um, and when you are in a trade-related job, you make, on average, about 18% more. And so you see progressive Democrats like Patty Murray um, and a number of House members who support um, uh, smart trade agreements because they recognize that trade smartly done um, can indeed help lift um, you know, good middle-class jobs. Uh, it's impossible to have a... Uh, you know, uh, a debate on this now. But again, I, I would simply look at history. Trade agreements have always had bipartisan support, and they've had bipartisan opposition. They've always made for interesting bedfellows, and this is no different. So you, you have experience uh, running the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department before you came to the Labor Department. Uh, and we look in the, the labor force, and there still is gender inequality. There still is racial inequality. How did what you learned in your experience working on civil rights translate into the Labor Department's approach to these issues of inequality uh, on racial and gender lines? Well, we've, um, one of the things that I'm excited about is I think we've done a lot more together, the Labor Department and the Justice Department. And I can give you one example in the disability context. Um, there's a lot of folks with disabilities who've been working in these sheltered workshops. Uh, these are uh, jobs in which they're making sub-minimum wage. And, and these are people who, in many cases, have tremendous talent. Uh, but that talent has not been uh, harnessed. And so we did a case in Rhode Island using the combination of civil rights laws and the Fair Labor Standards Act to um, help unleash tremendous potential in the workplace for people with disabilities. Um, so, you know, similarly, we've been using a combination of uh, labor laws, civil rights laws, and the bully pulpit in, in the gender context. Um, uh, I, you know, the, I meet so many CEOs now who understand that uh, they should never be afraid of data. Um, uh, Salesforce, Salesforce.com is, you know, a, a huge and growing company. Mark Benioff is the CEO. And... Uh, a number of his senior leaders, who happened to be women, came to him and said, I think we have an issue. You know, I think, I think women are being paid less who are doing comparable work to men. And his reaction was, let's get the data. And if that's the case, uh, we need to do something about it. And sure enough, it showed it. And, uh, and he was at the White House uh, in an event we did with the president a while back um, uh, surrounding executive action we're taking together with uh, the EEOC to make sure we're collecting this data because what you measure, you value, and what you value, you measure. And, uh, and so I think we're able to use a combination of both the bully pulpit and then our enforcement and executive authorities uh, to address this issue. Because Lily Ledbetter, uh, you know, the first bill that the president signed, you know, she was getting um, paid unfairly at, I think she was at Goodyear in Alabama, and she didn't know it until she got an anonymous note from someone. And, um, and that's not fair. And so we're making progress. Um, but again, this is the unfinished business of America, uh, Ted Kennedy used to say, referring to civil rights. And, and we're better off now, I think, than we were um, eight years ago. We, we have a hate crimes bill, finally. Um, uh, we, we're making progress on gender equity issues. Um, but we still have, you know, we still have a robust business. I'd like to be the Maytag repairman. And for those of you older, over 50, you understand that reference. There was a commercial where the Maytag repairman would sit there next to a telephone, a landline. I don't know if you've ever heard of landlines, all of you who are <laughs> under 25. They're these big things um, uh, next to your Rolodex. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, waiting for the phone to ring because the Maytag product was so good. And, you know, our phone continues to ring off the hook because we still have many civil rights challenges. 
So there, there are new business models coming up, uh, Airbnb, uh, Uber, uh, companies like that, that many people will think create new opportunities, but also pose some challenges. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on sure. those new business models and how do we make them work? We, we did a three-day symposium on the future of work last year. This is a very exciting area and an interesting area, and, and uh, we're doing a lot of work together with the Aspen Institute. Um, Senator Mark Warner has been very engaged in this as well. And um, innovation, as I said before, is our middle name. We, we, you know, we, we, we've constantly innovated. Uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, brought about uh, really a three-plus decade discussion about what the social compact in America should look like. And, it was only after the Great Recession that the social compact of the 20th century emerged. We're having a similar, uh, we're having a similar conversation now about what does it look like. It's and I've, we've done a lot of focus groups with Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, with folks in um, with uh, with CEOs and uh, who want to have their workers be W-2, but they have challenges getting venture capital. Um, and and we've talked to venture capitalists. And I get back to what I said before, which is um, I'm a big fan of innovation, but I think we have to make sure that it's inclusive innovation. Because if, if we're going to build an economy where everybody is a, you know, a high wire artist without a net, um, we're going to have a lot of casualties. And uh, that's why we're having conversations not only with advocates, but with these businesses. Because a lot of the businesses who want to survive for the long term understand that they can't churn through their employees because it's hard to build for the long term. And if you want to have a, um, a, health, a home health care business that's an on-demand business, and I spoke to one of those CEOs, he wants his workers to be W-2 workers because anyone who's ever had a loved one cared for, you can't have a new person every day. That's not a viable business model. So inclusive innovation to me is the key. And, and I don't have answers. There's a lot of folks who proposed another category of workers and this and that. And I, and I'm not prepared to say that's the right thing. Right. I think we're going to see a lot of innovation um, out there. You're seeing it in Seattle right now. They're doing some things. And, and we're going to see these incubators of innovation emerge. So uh, dealing with uh, diversity, uh, how, how do managers, uh, what kind of strategies do you recommend for managers to, 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 to transfer diversity from something we tolerate to something that's an active uh, asset for them in terms of building their companies? How, how, are there things that they I should think, do, can yeah, do? Yeah, I mean, I think our next generation is, like, way ahead of us on this. I, I, my kids go to Blair High School, and there's a couple Blair parents here. And, you know, my, my middle kid just graduated. The, the two speakers, one is a, a Muslim young woman who wears a hijab, who was the prom queen and played it on a basketball team that my friend coached. And the other was an immigrant from Ethiopia who uh, didn't speak a lick of English six years earlier. My kids embrace it. Um, uh, the reason Fortune 500 companies in abundance filed briefs in the Fisher case and in the Gruder case before that was because they recognize they can't compete in a global marketplace unless they have uh, a workforce that's uh, linguistically and culturally competent. And so we've done a lot of work at DOL to address this issue. We did a, you know, we did a afternoon symposium on subtle bias because um, I want to make sure that our supervisors uh, and all of our workers understand that you know we all bring baggage into the workplace, and uh, if we don't. Um, understand that and deal with it, we're not going to be uh, the workforce that we want to be. So I, I think um, recognizing that, I mean, I've done a lot of work with police departments. And, uh, you know, and the whole story, a big part of the story of Ferguson is you have a, a, a community that is overwhelmingly African American being policed by folks that not only don't look like them, but grew up in a segregated environment. You know, the, the story of Gruder um, and the reason the court upheld their race-conscious admissions policies was because something like 80 or 90 percent of kids entering the University of Michigan, the flagship campus, had, had, had no meaningful contact with a person of another race because of our housing segregation patterns. That's, we, we can't you know, we can't compete. That, that's not good for America. Um, and, and that's why I think these issues of diversity are so critically important. And, and 
Uh, Forward-leaning business leaders are getting it. Um, there's, un there's understandable pressure being put to bear in places like the Silicon Valley and Wall Street because they don't look like America. Yeah. So uh, one last question. If you had some advice for your successor, uh, whenever that person may come, uh, what would you tell them that they should work on uh, next? What uh, initiatives do you think should be first 90 days, if, if you were giving advice? Well, I, I, would, I, I guess I would have two categories of, of uh, advice, um, external and internal. Um, on the external front, we, you know, we need to keep pushing on the 21st century social compact. I truly believe that paid leave is a when question, not an if question. Um, just as the President Clinton signed the um, Family Medical Leave Act in 93, I think you were at DOL yeah. at the time, uh, uh, you know, that, was, that was a groundbreaking law, and we should never understate the importance and significance of it. But it's not enough, mm -hmm. and uh, we need the 21st century version. Uh, we also need to address uh, child care issues, and I think the Department of Labor is is well positioned um, uh, to do that. And so uh, these are the kitchen table issues that keep people up at night. And I, and I really believe that they are part of um, uh, a package of reforms uh, where the politics in Washington simply needs to catch up with where the people are. Because there's overwhelming support for this. I know so many people whose you know, uh, child care bills dwarf their rent and mortgage, and that's just nuts. Um, internally, I, I, I always had focus on, I had three or four external issues, and then the internal stuff really matters. I came up, I came of age as a career person. I've had 20 years now of federal service, almost half of which was as a career civil servant in Republican and Democratic administrations. And I appreciated folks who listened to me and respected my view. And, um, and I take great pride in building a workforce where people uh, have a hop in their step every day. I'm a firm believer that when folks are engaged, they are far more productive. And, um, and we've done a lot of work in that space. And I would make sure that I advised him or her that you want to keep it up because you're probably not going to get a lot of new dollars. And, and the best way to increase your productivity in addition to technology is uh, to make sure your workforce is engaged. And uh, I mean, so many of the things that people come up and say, hey, thank you for doing this or that. It wasn't my idea. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a first line worker. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you just listen to people. So Secretary Perez, thank you for the uh, wonderful remarks and uh, taking the time to be with us today. Please join me in thanking Secretary Perez. Thank you.